Hey everyone, like I mentioned on social media last night, I managed to get my hands on the brand new Chevy Bolt EV for 24 hours. And so I figured I'd share with you guys. Now I'll be making some comparisons to my Tesla Model S back there, um, but my intent here is not to compare the cars to each other directly because that's a bit silly. They are very different cars and well, you know, one of them costs a lot more than the other. That said, there are still useful things to compare between the two cars like driving experience as it relates to regenerative braking, or the infotainment approach that was taken by each company, uh, the amount of driver assistance as far as guiding you to charging stations, or how about how the vehicle relays efficiency information and range information to you. These are all valid things to compare between the two cars because these things really don't have a lot to do with the price point of the Model S, but rather the software direction that was chosen by Tesla. So that's a fair thing to compare to the Bolt. Now, because people ask me a bunch of questions, I'll be comparing some other silly things too, but that's, you know, people are curious. Can't blame them. We have a storm rolling in, so you'll have to excuse the wind. But without further ado, here it is in the only sensible color, bright orange. version I was able to get a hold of was the Premier trim, which is basically the fully loaded version. And looking at the sticker, that fully loaded version is not exactly cheap, coming in at a total of 43,900 sticker. Uh, now this one is also equipped with CCS charging capability. And here, flip down the little thing, it's right there. Downside, however, DC fast charging provisions. It's a $750 option. Let's take a look at the inside. Come on. So here we are inside of the Bolt. Got your steering wheel controls here, instrument cluster, uh, infotainment, most of your HVAC controls. I'll get into that in a little bit. Got your gear shift down here, parking brake release, some uh, storage in here, leather seats. This is actually perforated leather, um, and they're two-tone. It's very nice. It kind of, you know, the, I wasn't I wasn't really digging the solid dark gray. Uh, there's an inductive phone charging pouch right there uh, with little rubber inserts that I, I guess will allow you to fit different phones. Most of the interior materials are hard plastics, even the, the white stuff. But despite being hard plastics, uh, they added, let me see if I can I can get this here. They added a nice uh, pattern texture to the white areas, you can see here, and it makes it look much nicer. It, it looks like a material you'd expect to be a soft touch material, but it's not. Um, and it breaks up the interior nicely. Obviously the Bolt is not a big car. <laughs> it is a fair bit smaller than the Model S. It's, um, I'd have to look up the actual specs for it, but I would guess it's probably... Uh, it's not as big as a Leaf. I mean, I had a Leaf for three years. This car is not as big uh, as, as the Leaf is, uh, nor does it have as much storage or cargo space. Uh, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's bigger than a Fiesta, but smaller than, than like the, the Focus or, or um, uh, Leaf. So it's, it's somewhere in the middle there, I think. Uh, again, I'd have to look it up and check the numbers, and I'm sure you can do that too, but just this is sort of my seat of the pants impression here. Speaking of the seat of my pants, one thing that both my wife and I noticed when we got into the car is that the seats feel, well, the front seats at least, feel oddly narrow. And we're not wide people. I mean, you know, I'm, what, 5'9"-ish, five, 135 pounds, maybe? And fairly narrow. And the seat bottoms, they, they feel like they, they kind of squeeze, kind of, you know, they sort of squeeze your butt. But the seats are very comfortable. And that's surprising considering that, you know, well, this is basically a $20,000 car interior, you know, or something of that class uh, in a car that costs $44,000. But I could see how some people who are perhaps a bit wider than me may have issues 
with these seats, best advice is just go try them. However, I wonder if how they feel actually correlates to their width. Let me go grab a tape measure. Down here toward the base area, what are you, what, what's, what's that? That's, that's about 17 inches. And I really only have about three fingers width between my hip and the uh, seatbelt buckle there. So it's about 17 inches. Let's go take a look at the Model S. Let's see, looking at the Model S here, I got this at about the same point in the seat. It's about 20 inches-ish. Okay. All right, let's just for funsies compare it to an Accord. Uh, yep, about 20 inches. Hmm. Car makers, stop doing things like that. I feel like I got a little distracted there with the seats. But, uh, yeah, so it turns out they are narrower than the seats of the Model S or the seats of an Accord. In typical automaker anachronistic fashion, to turn the car on, foot on brake, press big fat power button. I swear, Tesla spoils us so much. There we go. And it slowly comes to life. Not yet? Come on. There you go. So... Uh, the screen is at a wacky angle. I see why they did it, but it's really hard to record. Let me see if you can see that. It's pitched that way, like a lot. And I understand why. Because, well, it means that you don't have to kind of hover your finger and hope to tap the right thing. It's very much a downward operation. So probably great for actually using on the road. For video, though... The screen does have some glare issues at certain angles, and when hit by direct sunlight, uh, it can get kind of hard to see. I was mentioning earlier that uh, most of the climate controls are here. Well, that's true. Most of the climate controls are here as physical buttons. However, some of the climate functionality is actually here on this bar on the touchscreen. This, to me, is an issue because um, when you present most of the controls as physical buttons to the user, then that sets up uh, the essentially UI paradigm as being, okay, HVAC is physical buttons. Except if you want to shut HVAC off, there is no physical button for it. You have to turn it on or off by pressing there. Uh, and then you have recirc here, but not here, and, and other things like that. And actually pressing these elements here basically does nothing. I feel like this could have been done much more intuitively by either making all of HVAC, HVAC buttons or by making redundancy on the screen and in buttons. It's by mixing it this way, um, you totally get used to it, but it it's not the most intuitive thing in the world. That random nitpick aside, this is the home screen. Gives you your, ra your radio information, Bluetooth information, uh, basic charge settings, and energy use, distance traveled, so basic, you know, energy usage, sense f last full charge. And it breaks it down uh, in a little pie chart here by uh, driving accessories, climate settings, and battery conditioning so you know what's using the most power or how your, your power split is actually working out. Now your basic charge settings are immediate or departure timer. Um, so anyone who's had a LEAF is familiar with departure timers. Uh, there are also several other EVs that, that have uh, departure timer functionality. This screen is customizable and you can move things around and rearrange things. Uh, you can also go into the energy screen here. This is where you have your basic charging settings. So charge immediate starts charging the moment that you plug the car in uh, there's a limit in here for 8 amps or 12 amps when you're charging via 120 volt and then you have departure timers which if you've had a leaf or any of the other EVs aside from a Tesla um, you can set the time you want it to be done by and it handles the rest again another minor UI complaint hitting the large green fields does nothing you must hit the little dot that's a little annoying. You can set whether you want it to be off-peak only, cost optimized off-peak and mid-peak, cost optimized all rates. So if we do off-peak only, uh, yeah, basic information about what that does. Okay, edit electricity rates. Um, let's see, earliest possible completion, electric rate schedule, and you can program in your, uh, your, your electric rate schedule so that your car will know what your time of use billing is like and, and therefore you can set charging preferences based on the time of use billing. That's actually kind of cool. I don't think it's something I'd ever use because I've always just used the approach of, you know, I know when my super off peak is at night and I plug the car in and have it start 
at a time where, you know, super off-peak starts, or maybe a little later. Like, if I know I'm not driving very much with the Model S, I'll just tell it, you know, oh, start charging at 3 a.m., whatever, it'll be done by the time I'm ready to go. That requires a little more thought. Hypothetically, with a system like this, you could just punch in all the data and never have to think about it so long as you plug the car in. That's kind of kind of neat, actually, um, but it's a little, uh, a little more in-depth than I think a lot of people would want to go. There's at least one thing that is um, rather conspicuously uh, missing from the, the energy panel here, and that is any kind of user configurable uh, target state of charge. When you plug this car in, it charges to 100%. That is all it will charge to. There is no user setting for like a 90% charge or an 80% charge or anything less than that. Whether or not that will be a problem, I don't know. It, it really depends on how GM did their, their pack reserve, whether the reserve is top and bottom, bottom only, how they've structured the pack and what their pack chemistry is like. So I can't really say whether it's an issue, but it does remove a certain level of user choice. Leaving the energy menu and heading over to the thing with the four dots, which are basically your apps, you've got audio, phone, projection settings, gallery, OnStar, and camera. Audio is for your basic AM, FM, XM, radio, and all that stuff. Phone is to make calls and stuff. Projection, uh, that's the app that you open to utilize either Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. This is compatible with both Android Auto and CarPlay. You got vehicle settings. The gallery is, I don't know why that's even there. It, it will like pull, pull stuff off of USB and like display things or whatever. The camera. The camera, that one is somewhat inexplicable. And I say that because, well, you poke it, unavailable while parked. If you were to put the car in drive, it would tell you unavailable in drive. You can't open the stupid thing. All right, opening up vehicle settings, you have basic stuff, date and time, mirror seat reminder, language. Uh, you have restrictions for teenage drivers if you want to do that, basically parental controls for the car. Um, device settings, Bluetooth settings, let's see, vehicle. If we're going to vehicle, we get this, uh, so, let's see, fancy pants animation, do, 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 and there we go. So, auto fan speed medium, auto heated seats, auto defog, it, or, it's, uh, wow, that's slow. So, yeah, these are, these are kind of basic vehicle settings, it's broken down into a lot of menus. Uh, they will let you adjust your chime volume, which is nice, because it's rather ear-piercing. The vehicle does have a collision detection system similar to Tesla's automatic emergency braking. So you have forward collision here, which is set to alert and brake. Front pedestrian detection, alert and brake. Park assist on. Rear cross traffic alert on. Oops. Yeah, I'll just leave that on. Um, lane change alert on, which is kind of your blind spot monitoring, as I recall. Nope, that's your lane departure warning. I'm not a huge fan of the nested nature of all of these options. Because uh, it means it's a lot of a lot of menus and a lot of stuff to tap through to get to them, rather than the one tap one page kind of approach that Tesla took for most of the vehicle options. And what I mean by one tap one page is you get one page and then there are essentially tabs, whereas in this, you know, you, you hit this, and then you got to let's see, scroll vehicle, and then you got to so you're 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 drilling down pretty far here. Here's the instrument cluster. On the left here, you've got state of charge with the uh, estimated range uh, at 218 miles based on driving habits. And uh, the car only has 20 miles on it, so that's not really helpful in any way right now. There's not enough data for it to work from. And it shows a minimum range of 178 miles and a max range of 257 at the current state of charge. Now the EPA rated range for this car is 238 miles at a full charge. Um, this is actually an interesting way of displaying range information to a driver. And I say that because um, it reflects both of the extremes, because uh, as any EV driver can tell you, the range that you can get out of an EV um, varies wildly depending on a lot of factors. Um, you know, how much, how much you're driving uphill versus downhill, how much regen you're using, how fast you're driving, how hard you're accelerating, uh, what the outside temperature is, whether you're running in the heater, air conditioner doesn't have that much of an impact, but it still impacts some. Uh, what what else? Oh, right, whether it's windy. Uh, there are so many factors that influence it. 
Uh, so it's kind of neat to see a like you know minimum maximum, and then what what the the current driving data uh, is working out to as far as an, an estimated range goes. Do I prefer that over Tesla's straight like EPA rated display? Um, and that then that's augmented with usage. I don't know. I mean, I, I do kind of like the fixed EPA approach, um, but I can see this being very appealing to especially people who are new to EVs. In drive here, um, power as you accelerate goes up on this side, regen goes down on that side, and it displays both power usage in the positive and regen in the negative, though it doesn't really display negative, uh, over here. As far as I could tell on initial inspection, the car had no built-in nav, no route planner, nothing that would actually help you in any kind of long-distance driving in an EV. Then I stumbled across OnStar's navigation. Um, except it didn't exactly go as planned. So, directions... Right. Now say, plan route, directory, or store destination. Plan route. I'm sorry. To use the plan route command, you need to have stored destinations. To get a route now, Please push the blue OnStar button. Returning to the main menu. OnStar ready. Adding destinations tells me to press the blue OnStar button. Pressing the blue OnStar button calls OnStar. I'm going to operate under the assumption that you're expected to use either Android Auto or Apple CarPlay as your nav. Which, that's great, except for, well, Google Maps and Apple Maps don't really have built-in provisioning for um, interfacing with the vehicle in such a way as to aid in long-range travel or tracking down charging stations. I think they just want you to call OnStar for that? It occurred to me that not everyone watching this may be familiar with Tesla's trip planner software, what it does or why it's important. So if you want to learn more, hit the annotation or there'll be a link in the description. Someone asked how quickly the Bolt could get to 60 and then wanted me to compare it to the Model S. While I think that's a little silly and I don't have any of the appropriate instrumentation to do it, um, I can always use the old aim and camera at the speedometer trick. Yeah, why not? One thing that the Bolt can do that a Tesla cannot is it will actually regen you down to a stop if you're an L. You also have this little paddle on the back of the steering wheel to engage extra regen. Anyway, let's go to 60. So the Bolt is not as quick to 60 as a Model S 70D. Big surprise, right? Uh, however, it will out-regen the 70D. The highest regen numbers I've seen reported by the Bolt during operation when not at full charge uh, were just north of 60 kilowatt, which, as I recall, is a smidge more than the 70D will actually pull. At a higher state of charge, yes, regen is limited in the Bolt. However, even at a full charge, you still have some regen. You can one-pedal drive the Bolt if you shift it down into the high regen mode, which is L. That's something you cannot do with a Model S or a Model X. At a full charge, uh, your regen is non-existent and then really slowly fades back in. Driving the Bolt around one pedal reminds me a lot of the little bit of time that I spent driving around a BMW i3. Um, both of, both vehicles will bring you to a full stop using regen, and I, if I remember correctly, I believe the i3 mixes in friction brakes. Um, I'm not sure if Chevy is playing the same sort of game with the Bolt, uh, but either way, it makes for a, a really nice one-pedal experience. In normal D mode, uh, the car does not regen brake very hard, um, and it does creep. Uh, creep is always present in reverse. It's a pretty energetic creep in reverse, so make sure you're on that brake pedal or you are going to move much farther than you think. As far as actually being able to lay down power, the Bolt doesn't have a ton of power. It's rated, I think, at like 200 horsepower, if I remember correctly, and front-wheel drive. Not a ton of power, but it has trouble putting it down. Uh, as you probably heard, sort of, during that 0-60 to 60 run, um, there was lots of tire scrub. And so if you're at a stop and you punch the throttle, you're going to get nothing but tire scrub the whole way. Um, if there's any steering angle input and you, you roll into throttle, you'll get tire scrub. 
Um, so it, it really has trouble putting down uh, what power it has. And I think a lot of that's just due to the low rolling resistance tires that are on the car. I mean, higher performance low rolling resistance tires do exist. Um, they are not on this car. As far as handling and, and driving experience goes, um, you know, it's it's kind of a smallish hatchback. It has more body roll than I would have expected, um, given how much weight it has down below with that 60 kilowatt hour battery. Um, but it's not an unreasonable amount of body roll. The steering rack is fairly quick, which at higher speeds can make it feel a little twitchy, uh, but nowhere near the level of sensitivity that I experienced in the i3 on the freeway. That just kind of felt a little squirrely. Um, this does not. So yeah, the Bolt is not a bad car to drive at all. It's fairly enjoyable, and it's certainly not slow. Now, I said the Bolt is a small car, and it is, but quite a few of you asked about headroom. There's a fair amount of headroom. Like, a lot of headroom. Miles of headroom in the front. I've seriously got like almost an entire hand above my head. This is a lot of headroom. And the back seat is surprisingly spacious as well. I have kind of short legs, but the driver's seat is set to where I'd normally have it. And I have lots of knee room here. Um, like I said, I have kind of short legs though. Fair amount of foot room, actually a lot of foot room. And as far as headroom goes, I've got what, maybe Two, three inches, two inches? What's that, two inches? Two inches. Probably about two inches of headroom. Um, the only thing that feels kind of tight is I do feel like I'm really close to this pillar that runs through here and the C pillar that kind of comes down this side here. It, it, that just feels really close to my head. Um, but aside from that, you know, it's headroom's good. Headroom in the Model S, eh, not so much. I mean, I still have a fair amount because the seat's uh, fairly low. But I uh, have to have my tur hand turned this way rather than this way. So it's a pretty big difference. The back of the Model S is a different story entirely because, well, I have no headroom. My head is actually touching the headliner back here, especially if I actually sit back and sit up. And um, I'm only, like I said, 5'9". I mean, my legs are kind of short and I have a long torso. But uh, yeah, there's not a lot of headroom back here in the Model S at all. You know that storm I mentioned earlier? That blew in way faster than I was expecting. And so now I have to take refuge in the garage because I can't film outside anymore. This kind of puts a kink in my plans. A bunch of people asked about practicality and storage. So let's see what you can put in the back with the seats up. So we've got a couple fairly standard uh, 14 by 22 by 10-ish carry-on bags. They're not, they're not very big. Um, and I'll put these in here in a few different orientations, give you an idea of, of how much space is actually back here. So if I put them in like this, that's, uh, that sticks out a bit. Let me, uh, let me show you there. Let me get this off here. It sticks out just a bit there. I'm pretty sure the hatch will still close, but that's about as wide as anything can be going back there, I think. Okay, so you could probably fit a third bag in here. Uh, let me just make sure the hatch closes with these in this orientation. <laughs> um, it closes, but one bag is up against the window. So a small carry-on bag is about as big as it gets in that orientation. Let's flip them around. In this orientation, both bags clear the seals easily and won't be pressed up against the window. And you've got a little bit of space here about, um, where did I put my tape measure? About seven inches. You've got about seven inches to work with in front of the bags uh, that you could put something thin depending on how far uh, this part of the hatch right here extends into the car. Just for the sake of comparison, uh, one of these bags can fit right into the footwell in the uh, the trunk space of the Model S. I could take the second and set it in there like that. Or I could take the second and put it in here like this. So yeah, not really fair at all in any way to compare. The Bolt also has an extra little storage space uh, underneath this 
well, basically a piece of carpeted plywood that they have down here. Lift it up like that, it drops in place, and there's a little little storage area down here where the uh, floor mats are and the EVC that comes with the car. And underneath that is, underneath that piece of styrofoam there, uh, is your like spare toolkit in what used to be, or what in a normal car, uh, would be the space for a spare tire. Uh, the bolt does not have a... Oh, well, that just, Ah, okay. See, they couldn't put this on a hinge. There we go. Do the back seats fold? There. Yes, they do. And it does create a fairly open space in here. And there's actually enough rear seat foot room to where I can put these flat uh, and a small person like me can kind of walk around in the back still. Which is really impressive now that I think about it. I should, whoa, shit, not again. I mean, it's uh, not exactly lay down a mattress room, but uh, it's not bad. A question I'm surprised that I didn't get from a Tesla owner. Does it have rear seat cup holders? Yes, it does. Quite a few of you asked me what its range was like in real life. That's a difficult thing to explain, and you EV owners should know better. <laughs> and I say that because there's a tremendous number of factors that go into determining how far you're going to be able to go. And you guys know that. Exterior temperature, driving habits, wind, the speeds at which you're driving, um, the, the grade of the road surface, whether it's raining or not, I mean, all of these things uh, impact your range. And without actually driving the car uh, enough to significantly exercise its range, like a bunch of you are asking me to do, um, I can't really give you that information. Uh, one thing that I probably should have mentioned was that there were some restrictions um, put on me as a result of the agreement I made with the people that I borrowed this car from. Uh, and that was that I could have it for 24 hours and I couldn't put more than 100 miles on it. So, I can't do a range test, I'm, I'm sorry. How quickly does the bolt charge on a CCS charger? Yeah, I can't really test that one either. In, in fact, you know what, do it, are there any, hang on, plug share time. Here's plug share. Those two stations down there are the nearest CCS stations. That's like 45 minutes away. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an extra hour and a half to do the round trip to find out, and even then, the state of charge would still be too high to really see what the peak would be. How does it perform as a daily commuter car? Comfort, ease of driving, space, noise, etc. How's the handling? More nimble or sluggish? As a, as a commute car or as a daily car, it's fairly comfortable. Again, I, you really need to sit in the seats and try them to find out if they'd be comfortable for you. But as far as comfort in driving, uh, once you get it adjusted, again, if the seats are okay with you, uh, the driving position feels fairly relaxed. Uh, you sit really high in this car compared to the Model S which is a really weird feeling to me because I'm used to driving cars that are fairly low to the ground and have a fairly low seating position, so Model S, um, uh, Mazda Miata, that kind of stuff. To me, this feels like a crossover as far as where you're sitting in relation to the road and your perception of it, and that I'm, I'm still having trouble shaking that. And from a forward blind spot standpoint, um, the A-pillars do kind of have the Nissan Leaf problem in that they are forward of you by quite a ways, and they're very large. Um, so you do, you do have some fairly sizable blind spots um, at the, the front corners. Uh, on the noise front, it's not as quiet as the Model S inside. Uh, that's not exactly a shock, um, but it's not, it's not really loud and annoying. On the handling front, um, it feels like a, 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 a darty, nimble little car. You know, it, it uh, doesn't feel sluggish, it doesn't feel um, big and boat-like. Uh, if you want to just, you know, zip right into a parking spot and not even try lining it up, just zoop right in, it'll let you do that. Uh, the Model S, to me, when it comes to parking, um, feels much more calculated. You have to be more careful about it. It is a much bigger car. You can't just chuck it into a spot like you can with this car. Does it come with a book or is the manual in the nav? Well, as far as I can tell, I don't think the manual's in the nav. What size tires? They are 215 50 R17s, front and back. How does it fare with range loss on short trips? Biggest downfall of Model S 
is the short trip consumption, especially when cold. That is a good point. The Model S does use a lot of power to heat its battery pack. Um, and if you're taking short trips, you're gonna have average consumption that can be, I mean, I've seen it in my own car, up north of like 1,200 watt hours per mile for really short trips, just because there wasn't enough distance to average things out into something reasonable. I didn't really notice um, short trips being a problem in the Bolt. Uh, I took, you know, some like two, three, four mile short trips around, um, and it didn't have a really huge impact on the state of charge, or at least it didn't according to the instrumentation the car gives you. That said, the car had been in the garage all night and had charged all night, so it wasn't like starting from a dead cold pack. In comparison to the Model S, what's the build quality like? The fit of all of the interior parts uh, in the Bolt was pretty good. Um, there's a little bit of sloppiness in some of the leather, uh, mostly the rear seats where the, uh, the airbags are in the sides. It's, you know, kind of wrinkly. Most of the panel gaps on the Bolt are tighter than the Model S, um, but you know, Tesla is exactly known for tight panel gaps. And from an interior materials quality standpoint, that's not a fair comparison at all. You know, I'm not, there's no point in making that comparison. This is a much less expensive car. So it's a lot of hard plastic. Um, they did well in making it look nice. Uh, just don't touch it. From a squeaks and rattles standpoint, um, there are fewer squeaks and rattles in this Bolt than in my Model S when it was new. And after rattles had been eliminated twice. Please demonstrate the Bolt's self-driving autopilot features. Yeah, it doesn't have any. I mean, you know, it, it has forward collision alert and a little bit of auto brake, and uh, that's that's pretty much it. Um, the cruise control does not behave like TAC, so it's not it's not a, a, a traffic aware cruise control. Uh, and uh, the lane keep assist, it's 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 not auto steer. You you just you ping pong, and that's yeah, no, no. What is the lowest current you can set the 120 volt charging to? In the manual, they only mention 12 amp and 8 amp charging, but I would need something that would go down to 6 amp or even 2 amp would be nice. I'd like to charge my car using my solar array, but I can only do it at night, and solar batteries work much better when you pull a small amount of current over a long period of time. I think in a Tesla, you can manually set this down to 2 amp, but I don't know for sure. The Bolt has the option for 8 amp and 12 amp only. Uh, it's not custom configurable like the Tesla is. That said, there is a workaround for you in this situation, and it's actually one that I would recommend more. Um, what you can do is uh, you can take your EVSE, uh, don't use the EVSE that comes with it, use like an open EVSE or something, and actually set the current limit in the EVSE for whatever would be appropriate from your batteries. So if you have, like I said, an open EVSE unit uh, that you have plugged into the car, um, tell it to set its pilot signal for, you know, two amps or one amp or whatever you want it to be and then that will tell the car hey you can't pull more than this amount of current and that's how you'll get down that low after 24 hours how obsessed do you feel about buying one how obsessed am i about buying one i'm not but not because the car isn't good uh, as a longer range city car uh, again like i said to like if i want to go from here to into la and back and uh it's I, it's a solid car you know if your commute is under 200 miles. Side note, yes, it's 238 uh, EPA, but I'd recommend you know, if you're like commute round trip without charging is like 180. This is a great car. This would, this would, this would be a solid choice, um, but it wouldn't really be more than that without significant improvement of the CCS infrastructure uh, throughout the country. I mean, California, we have tons and tons of chargers everywhere, but even then, it's really not enough. If I wanted to take this car uh, up to San Jose, for example, which is my, my frequent trip, trip that I take in the Model S, um, it would involve, I couldn't take I-5, I'd have to take either a 99 or 101, both of those would add significant trip time, I'd have to stop for much longer because most of those CCS chargers that are installed along those routes aren't very fast. I mean, they're 50 kilowatt, but that's it. Um, and on top of all of that, most of those locations, in fact, all of them, uh, have only one or two plugs. So if there's anyone else charging, I'm stuck waiting. Whereas with the supercharger network, uh, for most of the stations I stop at, it's anywhere from, well, if I stop at Tejon, six, but I, I stay away from Tejon. It's like 10 to 13 stalls. So I basically never have to wait unless I do something stupid, like go to Tejon Ranch on a holiday weekend. For those who are looking for uh, an EV, 
but aren't looking for one to do long distance travel in, I would have no problems recommending the Bolt. I mean, it's, it's decent to drive, it's not slow, it's fairly comfortable, there's a lot more space inside than you would expect. There isn't a lot of cargo space, um, unless you drop the seats, and then in that case you've lost your passenger space. But, again, if you're using it for commuting and, and longer-ish distance around town type stuff, it's great. I realized that this being a completely unplanned video, um, where I had a, a very short window of time to work with the car and an even shorter shoot schedule because of the storm that rolled in, the whole thing just kind of ended up a bit of a mess. But um, I hope I answered a lot of your questions. I'll be poking into various comment sections, both here and on Facebook and elsewhere, just to make sure that I answer anything that may have been missed in the video. But I think that's uh, about it. Later. Okay, it's so a quick supplemental tidbit. Um, so I just pulled into the garage and the cameras were up here and I put the car in park and now the screen's black. I, I think I may have crashed the bolt. Okay, at home. No. Drive? Mm, no. Park. No. Reverse. Ah! Ha ha! It's back. All right. Um. Park. Okay. There. There we. That was. All right then.